Oops, yes, so this is going to be a very short introduction to causality and how it can be applied uh, using machine learning. So um, every talk of this sort should probably start with um, this, this cartoon, which is now pretty famous. Um, but I'd also like, just like to, to iterate, reiterate the statistician's mantra that correlation does not imply causation. And this, this cartoon is sort of um, a humorous way of illustrating this fact. But it's a very serious issue and mistakes can be made even by the biggest companies in the world. Uh, so this is an example from um, Amazon um, where someone has gone to try and buy this bag and it's a bag that you can store a laptop in. And they have a, this recommender system down here at the bottom. And what it's saying is, if, you, if you're gonna buy this bag, then why don't you buy a laptop to go with it? And this is, this is clearly an example where Amazon just doesn't seem to get that the reason that these bags often get bought together with the laptop is because someone who buys a laptop might want a bag to keep it in. It's not that someone who buys a bag needs a laptop to put in it, right? So, so this is an example of them not thinking through how the recommender system is working. Okay, so this is uh, an example of what's called a, a causal discovery problem, right? So they, they're sort of acting as though um, because these two things are bought together often, if, if someone buys one of them, maybe they'll want to buy the other one. But it's clear from just from the prices that that's not very likely. So this is um, an example of something called causal discovery, which is part of um, this very large topic of causality. So it's where you've got a, a set of variables and you don't know what the causal structure is, but you want to learn it. That's not what we're going to talk about today. So today we're going to talk about another also extremely large, in fact, probably larger, um, set of tools that are used in, in causality and it's causal inference. So we're going to assume that we know what the structure is more or less and we want to estimate a causal effect of some treatment given that we know that structure and that's all we're going to look at today. And I think of all the, the slides in this talk this is the most important one. So this is a list of books that you might want to go and look at after this talk to follow up on some of the things that I've said. So I'm not going to go through the list now, um, but uh, so Pearl's Primer um, is very is very good for uh, as a, a basic introduction to some for someone who, who understands about probability but maybe doesn't have um, all the background on things like causal inference. And then particularly this book by Peters and Yancing and Sherlock on elements of causal inference is really good. Um, if you're interested in the machine learning aspects of causal inference in particular. And the other three books are also very good. So the slides um, will be made available after the talk and uh, you can come and look back at the references um, afterwards. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? So there are various frameworks for dealing with causal inference and the one I prefer to discuss is uh, causal directed graphs. And that's because I sort of think that somehow um, graphs are slightly more intuitive if you've never met these causal concepts before. So the first section I'm going to introduce uh, directly cyclic graphs and how one can interpret them um, for the purpose of uh, understanding causality. Then I'm going to discuss propensity scores, um, which is something that can be related to directed graphs, although traditionally isn't. Um, and that's another method that you can use for um, estimating causal effects is to work out what the propensity um, for someone to have a particular treatment is. And then after we've looked at that, we'll uh, look at a few, if we, if we have time, we'll look at three um, different machine learning methods for doing causal inference. The first is double selection. Um, the second is its successor, double machine learning, which you may have heard of. And then the third one is um, Bayesian additive regression trees. So let's start by thinking about causal directed graphs. And we're going to consider the following uh, setup. So we're going to assume we've got n independent individuals. Um, and they have either chosen to attend a training course or not. So the treatment is 
is binary. They either have attended the training course or they haven't. And the outcome that we're interested in, Y, is the change in salary from before and after the training or, or not after the training if they didn't take it. And then we also measure various other things about each of these individuals, including their age, race, and the amount of time they've spent in education overall. And the causal question we're going to want to answer is, what is the causal effect of attending this training course on the change in salary? And we're going to answer this using a, a real data set uh, known as the Lalonde data set um, that comes from a, 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 it's very famous, it comes from a paper that's written by uh, Robert Lalonde in 1986, and it's used a lot um, as an exemplar data set for causal inference. So what's a directed asymmetric graph? Um, so a graph is something like this object on the right here. Um, and it consists of these nodes or vertices, which are represented by letters, and these edges, which in this case are all directed, so we draw them as an arrow from one vertex to another vertex. And the only restriction we have is that you can't have any directed cycles, which means I can't follow the uh, arrows and then get back to where I started from. And hopefully, from a causal perspective, you can see why we wouldn't want that to happen. We don't want variables to be causing themselves. So these vertices are going to be associated with random quantities in our graph, random variables. So that would be things like age or sex and salary. Um, and the arrows are going to represent a causal dependence. And I'll make that a bit more precise uh, shortly. So here's a slide that I've put in for you to come back to. I'm not going to go through it now. Um, the only thing we really need to know right now is that if we have one variable pointing to another variable, so x pointing to y, we will say that x is a parent of y. And we're going to denote the set of parents of y by this pa of y notation. Okay, So that's the only thing I'm going to ask you to um, absorb right now, but I, I leave the slide in here for you to come back to and have a look at later. Okay, so how do we associate a statistical model with an object like this? Well, uh, the idea is that we're going to take a joint distribution over these five, in this case, random variables, and a distribution is in the model if we can write that distribution as a product over each of the variables conditional just on its parents in the graph. So in this example here, we can see, for example, that uh, W doesn't have any parents, so we just get its marginal distribution down here. Z also doesn't have any parents, so again, we just get its marginal distribution down here. T has the parent Z, so we get the conditional distribution of T given the, the variable Z, and so on. Okay, so this graph is a compact way of representing all these distributions that are of this form. And what's nice about DAGs is that you can also encode causal information in them, because you can sort of say, well, what would happen if I came and I fixed x in some way? So I, ha I did an experiment where I set, so maybe I randomized, so 50% of people have to go and take the training course, and the other 50% mustn't take the training course, then what we're going to do is we need to sort of break these edges because this treatment is not going to depend upon um, the two variables that it appears to depend upon in this graph. So we need to delete these two edges and we'll put a little box around x to show that it's been controlled by us. So what does that correspond to probabilistically? Well, if we think about this factorization that we saw before, all we do is just delete the factor that corresponds to the distribution of x given its parents. So we, what we end up with is effectively a conditional distribution over the other four variables, w, z, t, and y. Um, and then it's, it is of the form of a conditional distribution given, but, uh, given x, um, but it's not the same as the conditional distribution given x, because for that, I would have had to divide by just the marginal of x, but I've actually divided by a conditional given W and Z. And then the key is that all these other factors 
are the same. So nothing has changed about the way in which y depends upon t and x, for example, even though x is now been uh, and now has its, its mechanism overridden um, by us. And we use this notation um, do of x, which is uh, due to Perl, to say that we're not conditioning on the value of x, we've gone in and fixed the value of x to, to be this value little x um, that we've chosen. And it's important to know that the function that you get from doing this, this, um, this distribution down here, is just a probability distribution over these four variables. And you can do exactly the same things with it as you would with any probability distribution. So you can, you can get rid of some of the variables by summing them out or marginalizing them. You can condition on some of the variables just using uh, the usual conditional um, probability formula. And in particular, we can define expectations in the usual way. So uh, for example, the expectation of the variable y, i.e. what's its average value, when we go in and fix the variable x to have the value little x, well, that's just given by summing over all the possible values of y. But instead of multiplying it by the ordinary uh, marginal of y, we multiply it by this uh, distribution p of y given do x that we've um, derived earlier. OK, and now that we can do this, we can define what's known as the average causal effect of x on y. So it's just, if you have a binary treatment, it's just the difference between what happens if we force everyone to take the treatment, what is the average salary in that case, and, uh, and then what happens if we force no one, if we prevent everyone from um, obtaining the treatment, what is the average salary then? And it's just the difference between those two quantities that we're interested in. So, so, what, what, so why is this quantity different from just doing the naive thing and looking at um, the values of y when x is equal to 1 and the values of y when x is equal to 0 and, and comparing those two things? Well, it's because it's likely that there's going to be some confounding in the, in the observed data. So in this example, again, suppose x is whether or not you take the training and y is the outcome, and then z is sex and maybe women so that corresponds to, say, z being equal to 1, um, are more likely to take the training. And they're also more likely to have uh, more years in education, which might be represented by this variable t. And that, in turn, is likely to lead to them having higher salaries. So the problem here is that if there's actually no causal effect at all, and this arrow doesn't need to be here, there'll still be a correlation between y and x because um, if x is 1, it's going to be more likely that z is 1, and it's going to be more likely you've got more years in education, and it's going to be more likely your salary is higher. So this is a spurious path. It's not causal, because this edge from x to z goes in the wrong direction. So a naive estimate, where we just look, compare the average value for the individuals who happen to have x equals 1, with the values of the individuals who happen to have uh, no training, that's going to include correlation due to this confounding by z. Um, and this isn't a causal quantity. So how do we compute um, p of y given do x in this instance? Well, if you recall the formula I gave you before, all we really did was divide by this distribution of x given its parents, right? So this thing factorized into a product over all the variables given their parents, and we just got rid of this term. So it's the same as saying, let's just divide the joint distribution by this term. Okay, and, and then I said, we can just treat this thing on the left-hand side as an ordinary conditional, uh, as a, sorry, as an ordinary probability distribution. So if I want the value of y given do x, I just need to sum over w, z, and t. OK, so let's do that on the right hand side as well. And now we can sort of factorize this ratio into three bits as the things that come before x, which are its parents in this case, w and z. And then there's x itself. And then there's y and t, which don't 
appear in the in the denominator. So what we'll get when we do that is uh, the marginal over w and z, this conditional, and then finally this conditional here. Obviously, this conditional gets cancelled out, so we just end up with um, this formula here. And now the treatment, sorry, uh, the years in education variable t only appears in this right-hand term, so I can just um, sum it out. And this formula that we get here is called an adjustment formula. And what we're doing is adjusting for the values of these confounders w and z. Okay, and the parents of a, of a variable that we want to set as the treatment is always a valid adjustment set. So here's a slightly expanded version of the graph that we've been looking at. So we've added here um, a mediator between x and y, and a, a parent of that mediator l, and another parent of y that's um, otherwise unrelated to everything. So in this graph, um, how, how would we get a valid adjustment set? So we know that we can use the parents of x, we can use w and z, and that's valid. But all we really need to do is ensure that we don't we don't adjust for anything that's on the causal path, which are these green paths here, these green edges. So we can't adjust for x, for m, or for y. If we adjust for m, then we're going to block some of this causal effect that goes through m, and that's obviously not good. Um, so we, we mustn't adjust for anything on these green green edges. On the other hand, we do need to block the spurious path, right? So I need to make sure I do adjust for either z or t or both of them. So there's three combinations of um, sets that I could um, use to, to block this backdoor path. And then all these other variables that aren't on a backdoor path, I can choose whether or not I want to adjust for them. Okay, so there's three other variables. So there are eight subsets of those variables. And so in total, I'm gonna have three times eight, which is 24 different valid adjustment sets I could use. Okay, then the next sort of maybe obvious question is, which one is the best to use? So when I say the best, I mean, it will give me the right answer, at least if I have enough data. Um, but what I want for a finite sample is that the variance of the estimator is as small as possible. So I want to make sure it's as stable as it could be. And it turns out that the um, optimal in terms of the uh, variance of the adjustment set um, is given by something which is very different to the parents. So that what, what we should use are the parents of anything that's on a causal path other than the treatment that isn't itself on a causal path. So in this graph, the things on the causal path that aren't the treatment are M and Y. And the parents of those guys that are not on the uh, causal path, so Y has T and S, so we should adjust for them, and M has L. So the, the optimal adjustment set is these three green guys, T, S, and L. So I mean, why is this the optimal adjustment set, right? Why, why is it better than just using the parents of, of x? Um, so there's some things to notice here. We don't control for instruments. So an instrument is just a variable that only affects the treatment um, and nothing else. So we do, in particular, Z, w does not get controlled for in our adjustment set. And that's because um, if we condition on the instrument, we're only going to increase the variance of the estimate because it will account for some of the variance in X, um, and it won't account for any of the variance in Y if we condition on it. So it's sort of a, it's a very bad idea to try and condition on an instrument, um, as we'll see in a sec. In practice as well, in a finite sample, you're going to introduce bias um, by conditioning on an instrument. So it's not a good thing to do. So let's think about some intuition here. So why, why is it best to control for these guys that are close to Y, but bad to control for things that are close to X, which is 
seems to be what our optimal adjustment set is telling us. Well, we can sort of intuitively think of the effect estimation as a regression. And what we're interested in is the ratio of these errors. So this is a bit, a bit of a cartoon, but we can assume that we're regressing y on x. And the question is, what, um, what other things could we do to reduce uh, the variance of this and then increase the variance of this? So let's do a sort of numerical example to, to illustrate why it's important that the variance of this is big, the variance of this is small. So here I'm doing a little simulation in R. So I'm sampling X to be 100 random independent random normals with standard deviation one. Uh, y is just equal to X. So the, the regression coefficient, the true regression coefficient is gonna be one, uh, plus some noise, which also has standard deviation one. And then I'm just gonna fit a linear model to it and I get this estimate. So my estimate for the causal effect is 0 0.95 and the standard error is uh, 0.11. Okay, and then I'm gonna do the same thing, but this time I'm gonna reduce the standard deviation of X by a factor of 10. So now it's 0.1, and I'll keep Y the same, and then I'll fit the model again. And this time we can see we have a much worse estimate. So the standard error has gone from 0.11 to 1.1. So as I decrease the standard deviation of x by a factor of 10, the standard error for that coefficient goes up by a factor of 10. And we can sort of think about why that might be. So this is a plot of the original 100 data points in the, the model that was at the top. And we can sort of get a sense of how vari and this is the, uh, the line of best fit, this red line here. And we can get a sense of how variable that line of best fit is by um, doing what's called a bootstrap. So we, we resample these 100 data points with a replacement um, to get more um, data sets of size 100. And then we can fit the best fit regression lines for those guys, and they'll all be okay fits to the original data. Not the best fit, but a good fit. Okay, and you can see what the variation in these lines is like. And then, we can sort of gray that out and then plot over the other data set. So this is the second data set I simulated. And you can see the variation in X is now much less. And here is the line of best fit uh, that I get for this data. And then we can do the same thing again. And you can see that the lines I'm getting are uh, much more variable than the lines I started with. And it's sort of because, because this is narrower, there's less evidence of what the slope is. So it's, it's, you can see that there are many different gradients that will give you an equally good fit, or almost an equally good fit um, to this data uh, as the red line. And then we can do the same thing again, but this time we're gonna decrease the variance of Y. So again, this top model is the same as before, but now um, in the second model, I'm reducing the variance of the noise so the standard deviation of the noise by a factor of 10. And we can see that that decreases the standard error by a factor of 10. So it was 0 0.11 and now it's 0 0.011. So why is that? Well, if I again plot these, this new data set over the dots, um, the grayed out dots from the original one, you can see that now they're much closer to the red line, which is the new line of best fit. And if I do bootstraps here, the, the only lines that are gonna be sensible have to be really close to that red line or it's just gonna be obvious that they're not, um, not the, the right line. So this sort of illustrates why it's, it's really useful to reduce the variation in Y by adjusting for things that are very close to Y. And it's bad to adjust for things that are very close to X because that's gonna decrease the width of your um, of the covariate we're using to explain your outcome, in this case, the treatment. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to discuss propensity scores. And 
So just to tie it in with what we've just been doing, we know that we can adjust for a set of confounding variables z by using this adjustment formula that we've already seen. So, okay, at this point, you sort of think, great, we, we, we can identify what the causal effect is. But the problem is that if z is very high dimensional, which um, does happen a lot in modern applications, then actually estimating this conditional distribution is going to be very difficult statistically because we just don't have enough data. Even, even with very big data, there won't be enough to get a good handle on, on what this uh, distribution will look like. So an alternative is to try and find some function of z, which is sufficient to control for the confounding. So in other words, I could replace z in this formula with pi of z and sum over the values of pi of z, um, and it would also give me the same answer. So we know, of course, that if, if we understand the structure of the DAG, we can always use some valid adjustment set, and that's essentially the definition of a valid adjustment set. Um, but it, it turns out that you can actually always use a one-dimensional function, and that's just the probability of receiving the treatment that you actually received, sorry, just receiving, receiving the treatment uh, given the particular set of covariates that, you have, that the individual has. So in other words, what's the probability that this person attends the training program given the covariates that we observe for them? And this is something called the propensity score. So, so we can define our function pi as just the probability that someone attends the training given the particular set of covariates that they, they have. And we can plug it into the graph to see why it's a, a valid adjustment set. So if we look at our original example here, pi is, in general, it could be a function of w, z, and t, but you can see that um, t doesn't actually affect x. So it won't appear in this uh, conditioning set on the right-hand side. And I've just drawn these orange arrows to make clear that this is a functional dependence, right? It's not stochastic, this relationship here. It is a function of w and z. And then x will stochastically depend upon this, this function because we flip a coin, a weighted coin, um, with this probability to determine whether or not x is equal to 1. Okay, so the lesson here is that you can use this as your adjustment set, and then you always get an unbiased estimate of average causal effect. What you might notice is that this is going to be a really bad um, adjustment set in terms of the variance, right? Because this is explaining a, a huge amount of the variation in x and almost none of the variation in y. So the optimal adjustment set to use for this graph is just t because that will block this backdoor path. But of course, in general, we're not going to know the structure of the graph. So um, it's, it's actually often very useful to just be able to, to estimate the distribution of x given all these other covariates, and then use that um, as our adjustment set. OK. and. The most common approach to actually adjusting using a propensity score is just to shove it in your regression model. So if you want to know um, how y depends upon x causally, you can just add the propensity score as another covariate, sometimes called the clever covariate. Um, and then this parameter beta will be consistent for the um, average causal effect of x on y under some assumptions, right? So of course, it relies on the idea that this expectation can be broken down into this form. So in general, it's not such a big deal um, in the sense that uh, most models you can think of will, can be approximated in this way. And beta will have a meaning as something like the, uh, the, the best linear approximation to the causal effect if, um, if, you know, if x is continuous or something. And um, unless it's actually a really weird function of x and the propensity score, then it's probably going to be a reasonable estimate for the true value of uh, the average causal effect. The other thing it relies on, of course, is that your propensity score model is correct, right? whereas we, we're not going to know what that is, so we have to estimate it somehow. 
So what we'll actually end up doing almost certainly is, is trying to minimize this quantity at the bottom here with respect to beta and gamma, where this pi hat is some estimate of pi that we might have forgot by from doing an earlier regression. So typically people would do something like logistic regression to estimate um, pi. Um, so if this model is misspecified, then there's no particular reason to believe that beta will be um, will will tend towards the true beta hat. Sorry, will tend towards the true um, beta that you're interested in. An alternative approach is uh, something called inverse probability of treatment weighting. So the idea here is that you reweight the observations by the reciprocal, i one over the propensity of the of the treatment that was actually received. So if someone is treated, if someone attends the training course, we would uh, divide their, we would sort of divide them as it were, we'd upweight them by one over pi of z. And if they didn't attend the training course, then we'd upweight them by one over one minus pi of z. So this creates a sort of pseudo population. It's a pseudo population because um, you know, we don't have whole numbers of individuals anymore, um, but mathematically it, it works fine. And we've effectively empirically deleted this edge because now X and Z are independent in, in this pseudo population. And this means that we can sort of now treat um, the pseudo population as like a randomized trial and we can just you know, do a naive estimate of what happens when x is zero to y and what happens when x is one. Um, what happens to those salaries, people who didn't attend the training course versus people who did attend the training course. So let's just do a, a very simple example of this. So let's imagine that um, our treatment and our outcome are both binary now. So instead of salary, maybe it's did our salary increase by more than a thousand dollars and um, Let's assume also our confounder is also binary. And we're gonna then suppose that um, the distribution of x given z is uh, that the probability of x being one when z is equal to zero is 0 0.4. And when z is equal to one, it's 0 0.7. That is 0.4 plus 0.3. And then we can sort of write down the first few entries of some imaginary data set. And then we can compute on the right-hand side what the inverse weight we should use for each of these individuals is. So if we start with the top row, we've got z is zero and x is zero. So if we go up in here and we look, we see that the probability of x being one is 0.4. So the probability of x being zero is 0.6. So we divide by a one over five over three, which is five, one over three over five, sorry, which is five over three. And then for the second row, we've got z is one and x is one. We can see that the probability of x being one when z is one is 0.7. So we divide by 10 over seven. So we, sorry, we multiply by 10 over seven, I should say. Um, and so on. And the thing to notice is that, um, first of all, if you have a rarer combination, so the rarest combination in this case is when z is one and x is zero, then it gets a bigger weight. The 10 over three is the biggest weight we see. And um, the value of y does not affect the weight at all. So if we compare these two rows, these have the same z and x, but different y, but the weight is always the same. And indeed, you could always compute the weight without even knowing um, what the outcomes are. So if you want to do inverse weighting, there is another assumption that's necessary, and that is that you have this idea of positivity. So for every individual in the data set, you need that their propensity is strictly between zero and one. And if it doesn't hold, then reweighting is uh, really not gonna help you. So um, the reason for that is sort of that if we think about our formula, you kind of need to know the conditional distribution of um, X and the propensity in order to estimate it. And that won't be well defined if you have an individual who's treated and has propensity one, um, because there's not gonna be, um, there's not gonna be anyone who has, uh, 
if it's not treated and has propensity one. Right, so, and yeah. Okay, so if that doesn't hold, then this isn't gonna work. And it's sort of, that's a fairly fundamental um, problem with causal inference. If, if there are people who are guaranteed to be treated or are guaranteed not to be treated, then you have to sort of redefine the S demand that you're interested in. Um, otherwise, it's just not gonna be identifiable from, from data. Um, and as I said earlier, so typically you might estimate pi by something like a logistic or a probit regression, or if you wanted to do something a bit more advanced, you could use a random forest model um, to get your probabilities. So why might you have uh, positivity violations? Well, there's sort of two main reasons. The first is a statistical problem. So if there are too many categories in your confounder set, then some of them are just going to be empty. Um, because data sets are finite, even big data sets. Um, so, I mean, if you use a model like a distant regression, you should be okay because you'll then get something which is you know, greater than zero almost by definition. But if it's a random forest model, um, it's not it's not clear you will. Um, and the other sort of problem you might have is a structural one. So if you're interested in uh, whether a surgery is effective, for example, um, but some patients um, and the surgery is to remove someone's kidney, but then some patients maybe only have one kidney, then those people will have propensity zero, and there's no way you can identify um, what would happen to them if they were treated. So, um, yes, the, the sort of way people often get around that is to look at the effect of treatment on the people who were treated, um, because it's always possible to assume that they were not, um, not treated. Okay, so um, so now back to how we actually do things with um, inverse probability tr of treatment weighting. So let's suppose that we believe um, this regression model for um, how x, the expectation of y given z and x after we intervene on it um, looks. Then we can solve a reweighted least squares formulation that minimizes this uh, sum. So this is exactly the same as an ordinary least squares, except that I've got this weight here, wi, and wi is just the inverse of the propensity for a particular individual to have the treatment that they had. And of course, in reality, this would have to be um, p hat, because we don't know what this um, probability is unless the treatment was randomized. And I've just included a bit of R code here. So if you want to do this yourself with a real data set, um, you can just use what's the survey package, which you can install. And if you run this command, replacing that with your with the data frame that contains the data you're interested in, and uh, Y and X and Z with the, the, the variables that interest you, and WT here with um, this W, then uh, it will give you um, estimates that would be valid for the causal effect of X on Y. Okay, and there are loads of other methods that I haven't had time to mention, so um, I won't go through these in detail, but matching is where we take individuals who are similar but have different treatments, and we sort of compare their outcomes directly. So it's a very non-parametric um, method of causal inference. Stratification is where we sort of group people who have the same or similar propensity score, and we compare the treated and the untreated individuals in those within those strata. Um, you can also do things like G computation, which is where we take parametric models for this um, expectation and this distribution, and then we just manually compute what this integral is. And then a more non-parametric method is something like targeted maximum likelihood estimation, or TMLE, um, which extends the inverse probability weighting and the regression methods to higher dimensions. So you can do things with um, uh, much larger data sets than you can um, typically do with a standard IPW analysis. And there are loads of points that I just haven't covered here. Um, We've talked about confounding bias, but there are many other sorts of bias that you get in causal inference. 
So the obvious one is selection bias. So depending on how your sample is selected, um, you may induce spurious correlations. You can have measurement error, temporal effects, cyclic dependence, and, and, and various other um, contaminations of your data. So I haven't talked about any of those uh, in here, and you would have to look up uh, references for how you deal with uh, those sorts of issues. I've also only talked about the average treatment effect, but there are lots of other measures that might be of interest to us. So doctors are often interested in the intention to treat effect in, in uh, clinical trials, um, and that, that's often related to the effect of treatment on the treated. So that's where we assume that what we're interested in is for the people who were treated, what was the effect that it had on them? Um, and then somehow the controls, uh, the control individuals don't have to, um, doesn't have to be possible to, to treat them in order to estimate that effect. Okay, and then as I say, sometimes it's easier to identify these other um, effects than it is to identify the ATE because, um, for example, in, if I look at the ETT, it's defined like this, and there's this consistency axiom which basically says that this first term in here will just reduce to the ordinary um, conditional expectation, and the only difficult part is to work out um, what, what would happen to the uh, treated people if we force them not to be treated. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, a few applications that sort of make use of some of the ideas I've uh, discussed already. So the first is the double selection inference. And the setup here is we're sort of assuming that um, we know that X is a cause of Y. So we know that um, attending the training course is likely to have an effect on our salary later on. Um, and we know there are a bunch of other variables which um, are potentially confounders for this relationship. And the setup we're interested in is if that set is very large, so it's really high dimensional. So it's clear that we can identify the causal effect in the sense that if we had enough data, um, we could estimate this distribution here and uh, this conditional expectation here, and then just compute what this integral is. Um, but statistically, it's going to be very difficult because we're not going to have that much data. Like if, it, if Z is really high dimensional, um, we're going to find it very difficult to estimate this joint distribution here. Um, so, yeah, so of course we don't know what form these expressions should take, so we don't have a nice parametric family we can use, and even if we knew what the families were, um, it's just going to be infeasible with any reasonably sized data set. Okay, so here's just the graphical representation, and what we're going to do is we're going to make an assumption of sparsity. So basically, we're going to assume that a small subset of these Zs, which we'll call B, are the ones that actually have significant effects on X. Now, I mean significant in a sort of, not just a statistical sense, but a, a, a scientific sense. So it's actually a large effect. And similarly, I'm going to assume there's a, a set D, which may include the th some of the things in B, which has an effect on Y. And then I'm going to split um, my variables into four groups. So there are those that are in uh, B and D. And you can see they've got these strong edges to both X and Y. And there are things that are in B but not in D. And you can see that's got a strong edge to X and a weak edge to Y. There are things that are in neither and that has weak edges to both. And there are things that are in D but not B. And the idea is that if we account for variables in both B and D, then we're going to be guaranteed to have really good control of the bias when we're estimating beta, provided that the sets are small. And so if the sets are large, then uh, we're not in good shape. But if, the, if they are small, then we can uh, find them using something like uh, the lasso, and then we can combine them in a way which will um, en enable us to get an unbiased estimate of the causal effect of X on Y. And in, in principle, you can use any consistent selection method to choose these sets. Um, and in, in practice, in the paper, they recommend using a version of the lasso. Um, so let's do a little simulation. So let's suppose that we've got an X, which depends upon uh, seven of these uh, random normal variables I'm going to simulate. And um, we've got a Y, which depends upon X, 
um, through this parameter beta and um, a different seven, or a dis uh, not, not a disjoint set, but an overlapping set of seven of these ZIs. Um, so the ones from four, five, six, and seven are really confounders, and we definitely need to control for them. The ones for one, two, and three are not confounders, and it's probably bad to control for them. And the ones for seven, eight, nine, and 10 are, again, not confounders, but it's actually good to control for them because we'll be reducing the noise that's in YI. Okay, so we're going to choose beta and gamma both to be two and alpha to be one, and we're going to pick n is 100. And then the number of zeds we're going to include is 1,000. So although only 10 of them are actually in the model, um, we're going to have another 990 um, that we'll have to search through to see whether they're affecting x and y. So this is just the R code, which implements uh, what's on the previous slide. And then let's just first try a naive model. So we're going to um, just regress y on x on its own, and we'll see if we get the wrong answer, right? So we get 3.07, but we know that the true value of the causal effect was two. So uh, this is in about six standard deviations away from the true value, and therefore um, it's a very, very biased estimate. Okay, so that's not gonna work. And obviously we can't just include all the z's because there's too many and there's only 100 observations. Um, so instead we can use um, an R package called HDM, which is by the authors, and it implements double selection. So this is the command you need to run. And we see that you get um, something that's very much consistent with the correct answer. Now, as I recall, um, it actually selects the variables one up to seven and then maybe 10. So it does very well, basically. So it doesn't quite get everything in D, um, but it gets everything in, in B. So uh, that's going to be sufficient to control for the confounding. OK, and then we can do the same thing on our uh, Lalonde data. So it's not very high dimensional, but um, we'll, we'll go with it anyway. So we're interested in the average causal effect of the training, which is this variable treat, on the wages in 1978. So that's RE78. And there are various other variables that are measured, um, age, education, race, whether they're married or not, whether they have a degree, and their salaries in 70, 1974 and 1975. So we'll set up um, our R code like this and run the same command that we saw in the simulation with, again, the double selection. And the estimate of the change is now just under $1,600 with a standard error of 745. So uh, in terms of a confidence interval, um, we're getting something between 120 and $3,000. So it's a very, very wide confidence interval but it does suggest that it actually um, in increased wages by some amount. Okay, so that's double selection. That was in some sense a predecessor of um, this method that's known as double machine learning or de-bias machine learning. Um, so Cherna Jukov, the guy who's the main uh, driver behind double machine learning was also an author on this um, paper here. Um, and it's a sort of similar idea that instead of using the lasso to select variables, you just plug in a very high dimensional, a, a, a very um, powerful machine learning method to estimate what the function is that's going from the covariates to the treatment and then from the covariates to the outcome. And then you, you merge everything together in, in such a way um, that you will get a consistent and unbiased estimator of the um, causal effect of the treatment on the outcome. Um, so the methods that are used make extensive use of something called cross-fitting, where we split the data into um, separate components. And then and this allows you to use very flexible methods that don't converge at the sort of usual statistical rate, um, the root n rate, um, and yet still get um, a root n consistent estimator of the causal effect. Okay, and here's um, the 
some code to do double machine learning for the lawn data. Um, it's a bit odd. I'm not sure why, but I keep getting a negative um, estimate for this, which is a bit worrying. So in fact, we can use DML using the Actables software. So this is a graph um, from a pre-computed uh, model that's on uh, the Actable website. And uh, this is sort of showing you the treatment effect by age. So age has been uh, put in as an effect modifier. And you can see that it's always positive. So it uh, varies from about $1,000 to just over $2,000 um, for the 55-year-olds. And it's mostly not significant. right? So there's just this uh, area here where it looks like it might actually be um, positive. Um, we saw with the double selection method that maybe it is um, when you do it marginally. OK, and then the final method I just wanted to chat about was um, BART, which stands for Bayesian Additive Regression Trees. And the idea here is that we can learn the response surface using a very flexible method called, uh, called these Bayesian Additive Regression Trees. And we're just going to try and estimate what this function is for each of the two values of the treatment. So we're going to use an, a very nice, flexible, non-parametric method of estimating this. So even though Z is very um, high dimensional, we can use random forests, um, and it's a Bayesian version of random forests because it has a prior on, on when it should stop. So the prior that um, is recommended for, for this problem is to use um, this at a depth D in the tree, the probability of the node not being terminalized given by this expression here. And then um, you have some prior on the mean of the outcome, which is suggested to be normal, which um, means that you um, you can integrate out um, the mu ij. Um, unfortunately, when you run BART on our model, um, it never selects the treatment variable. So therefore, the estimated average treatment effect is just zero in this case. Um, and then I've put some R code in here, um, for which you can which you can try it yourself. Um, a bit of a warning, the BART package for R seems to be really, really slow. So as soon as you fit a model, for some reason, it um, everything becomes very, very slow. So uh, just a, a warning if you, if you try and do things in R. There is also a Python package, which I understand does not have this um, problem. OK. Right. So just to wrap up, so causal inference um, is a huge subject. And it contains a massive array of really rich and exciting tools that can help you to estimate causal effects and to perform causal discovery, um, and almost anything you can think of. And it's impossible for me to, to cover it all in, in less than an hour. Um, propensity scores in particular, which I have talked about, are very useful. They're not infallible, but they're very useful for performing causal inference on some particular effect. So if you, if you can just get a good estimate of the probability of someone receiving treatment, given all these covariates, then you'll be in very good shape for estimating uh, the causal effect of that treatment on another variable. Um, and on top of that, you can use these really interesting modern machine learning methods that can, can be combined with the classical approaches. So, you know, double machine learning is using very flexible uh, machine learning methods to, to learn these functions. But because it is done in this specific way, it means you do get statistical guarantees about the causal effect estimate that it outputs. So um, machine learning methods often don't have particularly principled outputs. But if you, if you use them carefully, you can make sure that the causal effect estimates that you get out do have good statistical properties. And as I've already said, there are loads of methods that I haven't had time to discuss here. So matching, um, I did mention difference and differences, negative and positive controls, instrumental variables, um, all like massive topics in themselves. And um, I, I implore you to, to go and have a look at those topics yourself. Um, just a brief bio of me. So my, my research is largely in graphical models and causality, as well as um, having a bit of an interest in what's called algebraic statistics. Um, and I'm most well known for my research describing uh, Bayesian networks, which are these DAG models I was talking about earlier. Um, with hidden variables, so where you don't get observable variables. 
and you can find more about me on, on my website, um, including some notes on uh, a master's level course on graphical models. Thank you very much. Hey, wonderful. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Robin, uh, for the, the class. Uh, it's great. Uh, I think that there is a question from the audience here. So, Maddy has a question about uh, is there a particular reason for the confidence interval not being constant over the effect modifiers? Yeah, so. Um... So that is just because you might have more data in the middle, right? So, um, so let me share my screen again. So if you've got more people who are um, around the age in the middle, so sort of 25, and you're assuming the effect's linear, which seems to be what's been done here, then it will be narrower here, right? And that's what we observe. So I, I now I can't remember what the age structure of this is, but I think um, it is clustered around younger people, so that explains why the um, the confidence interval is narrower here. But it's also just um, the fact that even if they, even if it were uniformly distributed over here, you would you would expect to get a sort of parabolic um, curve because if if you think about what's going on at the end, you don't have any information about what happens to older people. Right, because there's no one there, so you sort of only have a, a one-sided um, way of uh, figuring out what the confidence interval should be. Okay, cool. Uh, Matt D has also another question on the DAC. Uh, you select the parents for adjustments. Should you also select the parents of the parent? If so, how do you translate that mathematically? So, so no, you don't need to do that. Um, so you just need to select the parents and that is sufficient to block. So uh, let me see, where's that graph gone? Right, so if I wanted to adjust for M on Y, then I could just use its parents, L and X. And in fact, I could just use X because L doesn't block any, doesn't block any backdoor paths. So I wouldn't need to control for x, w, and z. And I could do that. It would actually give me a slightly more efficient estimator um, because I'd be reducing some of the variation in y. But I don't need to. Cool. I think it's very clear. Yeah, I think if we have no any no other questions, then I think we can uh, end here. And thanks a lot for attending. And thanks a lot, uh, Robin, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.